competence of parliament. Section 6A was included with the object of reducing the influx of migrants to India and dealing with those who had already migrated. The Assam Accord was a political solution to the issue of growing migration and Section 6A was a legislative solution. Section 6A is one more statutory intervention in the long list of legislation that balances the humanitarian needs of migrants of Indian origin and the impact of such migration on the economic and cultural needs of the Indian states. Parliament, even before the enactment of the Citizenship Amendment Act 1995, has treated migration to the state of Assam as a cause of concern. Previous sections of this judgment trace the enactment of the Immigrants Expulsion from Assam Act 1950 and the IMDT Act, which dealt with the specific problem of undocumented migration to Assam. The central government could have extended the application of the IMDT Act to any other state by a notification. However, no such notification was issued indicating that the immigration to Assam presented the union with a unique problem in terms of magnitude and impact. Though other states such as West Bengal, 2,216 kilometers, Meghalaya, 443 kilometers, Tripura, 856 kilometers, and Mizoram, 318 kilometers, share a larger border with Bangladesh as compared to Assam, 263 kilometers, the magnitude of influx to Assam and its impact on the cultural and political rights of the Assamese and tribal populations is higher. The data submitted by the petitioners indicates that the total number of immigrants in Assam is approximately 40 lakhs, 57 lakhs in West Bengal, 30,000 in Meghalaya, and 3 lakh 25,000 in Tripura. The impact of 40 lakh migrants in Assam may conceivably greater than the impact of 57 lakh in migrants in West Bengal because of Assam's lesser population and land area compared to West Bengal. Thus, the singling out of Assam is based on rational considerations. Similarly, the cutoff date of 25th March 1971 is also rational. Even before the enactment of Section 6A, the IMDT Act defined an illegal immigrant as a person who entered India on or before 25 March 1971 without travel documents. As noted earlier, the IMDT Act was not specific in its application to Assam. The enactment defined the phrase illegal immigrant for all states, though the central government did not extend the provisions of the act to other states. On 25 March 1971, the Pakistani army launched Operation Searchlight to curb the Bengali nationalist movement in East Pakistan. The migrants before the operation were considered to be migrants of partition towards which India had a liberal policy. Migrants from Bangladesh after the said date were considered to be migrants of war and not partition. Thus, the cutoff date of 25 March 1971 is reasonable. Having held that both the cutoff date and the singling out of Assam is based on rational considerations, the next question is whether the yardsticks have a rational nexus with the object of the provision. The answer is in the affirmative, since the, since the migration from East Pakistan to Assam was in great numbers after the partition of undivided India, and since the migration from East Pakistan after Operation Searchlight would increase, the yardstick has nexus with the object of A, reducing migration, and B, conferring citizenship to migrants of Indian origin. Section 6A would be under-inclusive only when all those who are similarly situated with respect to the object and on the application of the rational yardstick are not included. Similarly, the provision would be over-inclusive only when those who are not similarly situated with respect to these two parameters are included. That not being the case, Section 6A is neither under-inclusive nor over-inclusive. Article 355 casts a duty on the Union of India to A, protect every state against external aggression, B, protect every state against internal disturbance, and C, ensure that the government of every state is carried out in accordance with the provisions of the Constitution. All these three phrases feature in Part 18 of the Constitution, which deals with emergency powers. If the duty of the Union to safeguard states against external aggression is justiciable in view of Article 355, then petitions could be filed claiming that the Union has not appropriately dealt with any of the situations referred to in Article 355. It could also be contended that emergency powers ought to have been invoked by the Union to deal with the situations appropriately. Reading the duty in Article 355 into a right would effectively place the emergency powers with citizens and courts. Such a consequence would be catastrophic for the federal structure of the Indian Constitution and would subjugate the constitutional status of states. Article 355 cannot be elevated as an independent ground of judicial review in view of the purpose of the provision as a justification clause and the impact of such a reading on the federal framework of the Constitution. 
As a matter of constitutional principle, the mere presence of different ethnic groups in a state is not sufficient to infringe the right guaranteed by Article 29.1. Article 29.1 confers the right to conserve, which means the right to take positive steps to protect culture and language. The petitioners ought to prove that the necessary effect of the law that promotes the presence of various ethnic groups in a state is that another ethnic group is unable to take steps to protect their culture or language. The petitioner also ought to prove that the inability to take steps to conserve culture or language is attributable to the mere presence of different groups. The detection of the foreigner is an elaborate process that required the state to build manpower and infrastructure for its implementation. The legislature conferred the state with the duty to implement the provision after it had built sufficient infrastructure for the same. The purpose of Section 6A3 was to provide a long-term solution to the issue of the large influx of migrants from Bangladesh to Assam. It is true that one of the causes of concern which led to the Assam Students Movement and culminated with the Assam Accord was a dilution of the electoral right of those native to Assam because of the inflow of migrants. However, the purpose of Section 6A3 cannot be limited to it. The objective behind the enactment of the Citizenship Amendment Act 1985 was to deal with the larger problem of whether Bangladesh migrants of Indian origin could secure citizenship in India. The objective of the provision must be understood in the backdrop of the Indian policy on post-partition migration and the Assam movement. The principle of temporal unreasonableness cannot be applied to a situation where the classification is still relevant to the objective of the provision. The process of detection and conferring citizenship in Assam is a long drawn out process spanning many decades. To strike it down due to lapse of time would be to ignore the context and object of the provision. Registration is not the de facto model of securing citizenship in India. The use of the deeming fiction in Section 6A2 obviates the need for registration. The provision does not contemplate a registration regime for persons who fall under this category similar to Sections 3 and 4 of the Citizenship Act. Section 6A2 cannot be held unconstitutional for the only reason that it does not prescribe a process of registration. So I've, uh, I, I've uh, also come to the conclusion that the provision is uh, constitutional. Speaking on behalf of uh, myself and uh, my brother justices, Anam Sundresh and Justice Manoj Mishra, we have also upheld the constitutionality of uh, Section 6A. We have, based upon the arguments, uh, divided the issues which uh, came for our consideration in two parts, prefatory issues and then the challenges regarding constitutionality. On prefatory issues, there were two objections raised by on behalf of the respondents with regard to the maintainability of the uh, the very challenge. One was that the power of judicial review, whether it will extend to analyzing the constitutionality of Section 6A, and the second was that the writ petition were barred by delay and latches. So far as these two preliminary objections are concerned, we didn't find any merit. Both we have turned down. Then. On merits with regard to the constitutionality, we have formulated certain questions like does Section 6A offend preambular values like paternity? Is Section 6A ultra virus part 2 of the Constitution? Does Section 6A create an unreasonable classification which violates Article 14? Does Section 6A suffer from manifest arbitrariness? Does Section 6A violate the rights provided to indigenous communities under Article 29? Is Section 6A ultra virus Article 21 of the Constitution? Does Section 6A violate the political rights of the Indian citizens in Assam under Article 326? Does the operation of Section 6A causes external aggression and internal disturbance culminating in the invocation of Article 355? Does the Citizenship Act conflict with the provisions of the Immigration Expression from Assam Act 1950? And if so, how can the two legislations be harmoniously interpreted? And lastly, whether Section 6A violate international laws. While examining all these issues, as I said, the preliminary objections on judicial review and delay and latches we have turned down. On the question of 
fraternity. Our conclusion is that in many ways the petitioners want fraternity to be interpreted in a highly restrictive manner which allows them to choose their neighbors. Since this approach runs contrary to the very idea and ethos of the fraternity that was envisaged by the Constituent Assembly and as subsequently interpreted by this court, it cannot be accepted. Our reading of the Constitution and precedents is that fraternity requires people of different backgrounds and social circumstances to live and let live. The nomenclature of fraternity itself is self-explanatory to the extent that it exhibits the notion of inclusiveness and togetherness as opposed to restricted applicability. Thus, it becomes imperative to refrain from employing this concept in a negative manner that selectively applies it to a particular segment while labeling another faction as illegal immigrants solely based on the alleged unconstitutionality of Section 6A. There is a, the other contention was that 6A violates Article 6 and 7 of the Constitution of Part 2 that we have turned down saying the petition's contention that 6A is unconstitutional as it prescribes different dates in comparison to Article 6 and 7 cannot be accepted because Article 6 does not prohibit the granting of citizenship after the cut-off date of 19 July 1948. It only specifies the fulfillment of certain conditions which, as mentioned above, are also present in Section 6A sub clause 3. While Section 6A Clause 2 grants deemed citizenship without these conditions, the competence of Parliament to prescribe different conditions, which will be analyzed in a detail in the later part, is well embedded in Article 11. Similarly, while Article 7 prohibits citizenship to people who re migrated to India, this is only a subclass of people who have been granted citizenship by Section 6A. Since Section 6A grants citizenship even to people who migrated for the first time, the class of re-migrants is severable from this provision. As will be discussed in the following paragraphs, the Parliament was competent to specify different conditions for this subclass also. On the question whether the Parliament had the competence to specify different conditions under Article 11, we have upheld that power that Parliament possessed the legislative power to lay down and specify different conditions and such power is not controlled and regulated by part 2 of the uh, uh, constitution. The other contention raised was on based upon the dual citizenship that also has not found favor with us and we have held therefore based on the aforementioned reasons we are of the considered opinion that the framework outlined by section 6a is that an individual falling under section 6a2 and 6a3 can only assert Indian citizenship. Such individuals are presumed to have relinquished their previous citizenship. If authorities have reasons to believe that the previous citizenship is still being exercised, they are empowered under Section 9 of the Citizenship Act and associated rules to take steps to revoke the Indian citizenship of the delinquent individuals. Consequently, it can be deduced that the Section 6A does not contradict Section 9 of the Citizenship Act and we declare so. On the question of violation of oath of allegiance, again it did not find favor with us. We have said, moreover, the absence of such an oath does not absolve the immigrants from their obligation to respect the law and order of India, even when such oath is not taken before acquiring citizenship. Every citizen has to compulsorily abide by the norms of the constitution, statutory laws, and other rules and regulations. We need not further emphasize that once the immigrants have become Indian citizens by operation of Section 6A, they are regulated by the Constitution of India, the laws framed under, and the values enshrined within them. Hence, the explicit lack of an oath of allegiance before the conferral of citizenship by Section 6A does not absolve the immigrants covered under this provision from following the laws of our country just as any other citizen of India. On the question of Article 14, our conclusion is, as was discussed previously in paragraph 180 to 182 of the judgment, courts are generally tolerant of marginally under-inclusive legislations and recognize that similar cases may fall on both sides of the dividing line, provided that there is a broad discernible classification based on intelligible differentia. 
while analyzing validity under article 14 the court has to be cognizant of the fact that any division done by a classification cannot be mathematically precise and accurate as long as the broad purpose of the law is being fulfilled a classification cannot be deemed unreasonable we are thus of the considered opinion that even if there are states that could share similar characteristics with assam the comparison should be between two broad classes assam and the rest of india rather than each individual constituent of these two classes since other states in general were not facing similar issues the differentiation in classes was reasonable on the point of manifest arbitrariness we have divided in three parts one is the argument was that cut off date in section 6a uh, amounts to manifest arbitrariness that we have not uh, been able to accept and we have held nevertheless and as noted earlier the determination of a cut off date falls within the ambit of the policy makers and the court would be reluctant to impinge into such fixation save and accept when the assigned date is vitiated with discriminatory and arbitrary considerations since the cut-off dates in section 6a have been found not to offend the aforementioned principles we are not inclined to interfere in the prescription of such cut-off dates we may hasten to add here that section 6a does not operate perpetually and since it does not rescue those immigrants who entered the state of assam on or after 25th march 1971 and has become redundant to them the cut-off date prescribed therein cannot be said to be tainted with the element of manifest arbitrariness Similarly, the argument was that the procedure prescribed under 6A is also suffers with manifest arbitrariness. That also we have not agreed. From the above, it is clear that there are legible delineated conditions and a reasonable process envisaged under Section 6A and the Citizenship Rules 2009 for migrants who came before 1-1-1996-1966 as well as for those who came on or after 1st january 1966 and before 25th march 1971 we have then held the above statutes for the reasons assigned in the later part supplement section 6a and are to be read together we are referring to the other relevant uh, the statutes covering the same field together to create a harmonious code the process which runs through all of these legislations does not appear to be capricious or irrational we cannot therefore approve the petitioner's approach of singularly reading section 6a in isolation calling it incomplete and terming it manifestly arbitrary for not prescribing all conditions exhaustively then on the question of the last argument on manifest arbitration was with regard to the expression ordinary resident the expression ordinary resident we have examined from two prong one how the authorities will understood this expression and how those who are affected by the provision will understood it so first while examining the expression ordinary resident from the viewpoint of the authority interpreting and applying the law it could be observed that there is little vagueness in this term given that this court has already dealt with the same and expected its import particularly with the context of its usage in section 6a we have referred the judgment in khudiram chakma where this provision has been already uh, interpreted by this court then with regard to the second category we have said in addition it must also be noted that the phrase ordinary resident is used in various legislations in context not too dissimilar from section 6a beside the indian constitution it finds mention in section 5a and 10 of the citizenship act in the representation of people act 1950 in the life insurance corporation act 1956 the income tax act 1961 and the patents act 1970 among other statutes given such frequent usage it would be difficult to term ordinary resident as vague then we have referred to the case law hence the word ordinary resident in assam as contained in section 6a clause 2 and 3 cannot be seen to suffer from the vice of vagueness keeping in view the fact that the judicial officials constitute the foreigners tribunal their orders are subject to review by superior courts and there are civil administrative officers aiding the tribunal all of whom are well conversant with the nuances of the procedure contemplated under section 6a with regard to the second prong we have said on application of such a threshold with respect to the persons being regulated it would be difficult to hold that such persons would be unable to understand the simpliciter contour and indicative meaning of the phrase ordinarily resident and would find it so vague as to be unable to the meaning of the words this observation is further bolstered by the fact that none from the affected class of immigrants 
has contended before us that they found the term ordinarily resident to be vague or evasive. As regard to Article 29, we have held, we sum up our analysis of the petitioner's claim under Article 29 holding that though they have the standing to make such a claim, but on the facts of the present case they have failed to show either an actionable impact on Assamese culture or trace the cause of it to Section 6A. On the contrary, Section 6A, when read along with the larger statutory regime surrounding citizenship and immigration, mandates timely detection and deportation of illegal immigrants, a large portion of whom entered Assam post-1971. Since seen from this perspective, it is the non-implementation of the statutory regime which is the cause of the petitioner's concerns, their attack on the constitutionality of Section 6A is therefore misplaced. Similarly, on Article 21 also, because the arguments were same, our conclusion is that in a light of our conclusion, the preceding segments regarding Article 29, namely that the petitioners have not been able to show a constitutionally actionable impact on their communities. And if at all there is any such impact, it cannot be attributed to several factors beyond sex, uh, it, it can be attributed to several factors beyond Section 6A. The petition challenge on the ground of violation of Article 21 thus deserves to be closed at the threshold itself. With regard to Article 326, our conclusion is we are not inclined to accept the petition's contention that the influx of immigrant, immigrants in the state of Assam has affected the right of the Assamese people to vote. Moreover, there has been no violation of the right of the petitioners under Article 326 as it merely grants them the right to vote and be included in the electoral rolls, which continues to subsist to this day devoid of any interruption. As stated earlier, the petitioners have not claimed any violation of their statutory rights and have failed to demonstrate the violation of any rights under Article 326 of the Constitution. The last, uh, uh, one of the last uh, contention was with regard to the uh, conflict between 6A and provisions of the Immigration Expulsion from Assam Act 1950. That argument also didn't find favor with us. We have said, in light of the brief foregoing analysis of various statutes, we are of the considered opinion that Section 6A need not be construed in a restrictive manner to mean that a person shall be detected and deported only under the Foreigners Act 1946. If there is any other piece of legislation such as IEAA, the act which I just referred to, under which the statute, under which the status of an immigrant can be determined, we see no reason as to why such statutory detection shall not be given effect for the purpose of deportation. We thus hold that the provisions of IEAA shall also be read into Section 6A and be applied along with the Foreigners Act 1946 for the purpose of detection and deportation of foreigners. Similarly, in light of this, we find it difficult to accept the contention of the petitioner that IEAA is a complete code in dealing with the situation of immigrants in Assam and that Section 6A cannot prescribe contrary norms by granting immigrants citizenship. Since the two statutes operate in different spheres, we find no conflict existing between them. The parliament was fully conversant with the dynamics and realities while enacting both these statutes, the field of operation of the two enactments being distinct and different, and there being a presumption of the legislature having informed knowledge about their consequences, we decline to hold that Section 6A is in conflict with a differently situated statute, namely IEAA. Instead, we are satisfied that IEAA and Section 6A can be read harmoniously along with other statutes as held in Sonoval's case. None of these statutes exist as a standalone code, but rather supplement each other. On the question of international law violation, we have said it is not a justiciable right, and our conclusion is it is well established principle that international law cannot trump domestic law. Therefore, Section 6A cannot be assailed on the ground of the perceived violation of Article 27 of the ICCPR as well. With these conclusions, we have upheld Section 6A, but then we have further said, we hold that while the statutory scheme of Section 6A is constitutionally valid, there is inadequate enforcement of the same, leading to the possibility of widespread injustice. Further, the intention of Section 6A to restrict illegal immigration post-1971 has also not been given proper effect. Accordingly, we deem it 
if to issue the following directions. One, in view of the conclusion drawn in paragraph 387, it is held that section 6 of the Citizenship Act 1955 falls within the bounds of the Constitution and is a valid piece of legislation. As a necessary corollary there too, immigrants who entered the state of Assam prior to 1966 are deemed citizens. Two, immigrants who entered between the cutoff dates of 1 1 1966 and 25th March 1971 can seek citizenship subject to the eligibility conditions prescribed in section 6A. And immigrants who entered the state of Assam on or after 25th March 1971 are not entitled to the protection conferred by section 6A and consequently they are declared to be illegal immigrants. Accordingly, section 6A has become redundant who are those immigrants who have entered the state of Assam on or after 25th March 1971. The directions issued in Sarbanandra Sonowal are required to be given effect to for the purpose of deporting the illegal immigrants falling in the category of direction B clause 3 above. Next, the provisions of the Immigrants Expulsion and Assam Act 1950 shall also be read into section 6A and shall be effectively employed for the purpose of identification of illegal immigrants. Next, the statutory machinery and tribunals tasked with the identification and detection of illegal immigrants or foreigners in Assam are inadequate and not proportionate to the requirement of giving time-bound effect to the legislative object of Section 6A read with the uh, 1950 Act, the Foreigners Act 1940, the Foreigners Tribunal Order 1964, the Passport Entry into India Act 1920, and the Passport Act 1967 and the implementation of immigration and citizenship legislations referred to above cannot be left to the mere wish and discretion of the authorities necessitating constant monitoring by this court. For this purpose, we have decided that let this matter be placed before Honorable the Chief Justice of India for constituting a bench to monitor the implementation of the directions issued here and above. Here is the decision according to this court. <coughs> I have had the benefit of reading two very erudite judgments, one penned by my Lord, the Chief Justice, the, another one penned by my Lord, Justice Surya Khan. However, I have looked into the challenge to the constitutional validity of Section 6A of the Act by addressing myself on the question, I quote, whether the absence of any temporal limits in the scheme of Section 6A of the Citizenship Act has rendered the said provision manifestly arbitrary and thus violative of Article 14 of the Constitution. To put it in other words, whether the afflux of time has rendered Section 6A of the Citizenship Act temporally unreasonable and thus liable to be struck down in consequence of violation of Article 14. My line of reasoning proceeds on the footing that a piece of legislation may be valid at the time of enactment, but there could be a provision which by a flux of time may become temporarily unreasonable. That is how I have proceeded to express my views. I have said something about the scheme and mechanism of Section 6A, a close reading of Section 6A reveals that the benefit of citizenship to the immigrants from Bangladesh, as envisaged under the Assam Accord, has been conferred under the set provision in two distinct ways. First, Section 6A, subsection 2 provides that persons of Indian origin who came into Assam from the territories now part of Bangladesh before 1-1-1966 and subsequent to their entry have been ordinarily resident in Assam are deemed to be citizens of India. Secondly, Section 6A, subsection 3 provides that persons of Indian origin who came into Assam from the territories now part of Bangladesh on or after 1-1-1966, but before 25-3-1971, and since then have been ordinarily resident in Assam and subsequently have been detected to be a foreigner, shall be liable to have their names deleted 
from the electoral rolls for a period of 10 years from the date of their detection. The provision further stipulates that persons belonging to this category will be entitled to get themselves registered as citizens with the appropriate authority as per the prescribed procedure and the rules only upon detection as a foreigner and upon consequent deletion of their name from the electoral rolls. The rules for giving effect to Section 6A of the Citizenship Act were inserted in the Citizenship Rules 1956, vide the Citizenship Amendment Rules 1986, which were brought into force by the notification dated 15 January 1987. The number of immigrants belonging to the 1966-71 stream and detected as foreigner is significantly smaller in comparison to the approximate number of immigrants who had entered into Assam from Bangladesh between 1-1-1966 and 24-3-1971. This, in my considered opinion, doesn't appear to be solely due to the inadequate implementation of Section 6A, but rather due to the inherent and manifest arbitrariness in the mechanism prescribed under the provision, which I shall elaborate upon in later parts of this judgment. Then on the object sought to be achieved by the prescription of two separate cutoff dates, I shall read some portion. The cutoff date of 1-1-1966 clearly categorizes the immigrants into two discernible and determinable categories. The first category is conferred citizenship by the mechanism prescribed under Section 6A, Subsection 2, and the second category is conferred citizenship by the procedure prescribed under Section 6A, Subsection 3. Indisputably, Section 6A was enacted to give statutory effect to the political settlement arrived at in the form of Assam Accord. The accord was a result of years of negotiation that took place between the central government, state government, AASU, and AAGSP. The sui generis scheme of Section 6A also reflects this. wide moment against illegal immigration, which was led at the forefront by several student-run organizations. Initially, the demand of the protesting students was that the National Register of Citizens prepared in the year 1951 should act as the baseline for detection and deportation of illegal immigrants. However, during the course of negotiations, an understanding was reached that 24-3-1971 would act as the cutoff date for detection and deportation of illegal immigrants. However, to avoid deadlocks and expedite the settlement, a further cutoff date of 1-1-1966 was decided as the cutoff date for disenfranchisement as opposed to deportation of the immigrants belonging to the 1966-71 stream. In other words, the set cutoff date was decided as the baseline for detection of immigrants and their consequent deletion from the electoral rolls. Thus, it appears from an overview of the historical context that the only purpose behind the introduction of an additional cutoff date of 1-1-1966 and the corresponding concept of detection and deletion from the electoral rolls 
was to assuage the apprehensions of the protesting students. By mandating the deletion of all the immigrants belonging to the 1966-71 stream from the electoral rolls, it was hoped that the effect of wrongful inclusion of immigrants in the electoral rolls on the upcoming elections would be mitigated. However, as discussed in the later paragraphs of this judgment, the object of removal of the immigrants belonging to the 1966-71 stream from the electoral rolls could only be meaningful if it was given effect through an exercise of en masse detection and deletion conducted within a fixed time period. It can be seen from paragraph 62 of this judgment that the protesting leaders in Assam at the relevant point of time were opposed to the conduct of elections to the parliament and state legislature unless and until the names of immigrants were dropped from the electoral rules. It could be said that section 6A was a humanitarian and beneficial provision for the immigrants. <coughs> Sorry. However, to say that the sole object sought to be achieved by Section 6A was to confer benefits on the immigrants alone would amount to taking a reductive view of the historical context in which the provision was enacted. In the aforesaid context, I may only say that if such was the sole object of the provision, then there was no need for the legislature to create two distinct categories of immigrants who were eligible for citizenship. The legislature could have simply conferred deemed citizenship on every immigrant who came into Assam before 24-3-1971 from the date of coming into force of Section 6A. The very fact that a second category of immigrants, that is 1966-71, was statutorily created and subjected to undergo a more stringent test of procedure for the purpose of obtaining citizenship would indicate that conferment of citizenship was not the sole object of Section 6A, Subsection 3. The object behind insertion of Section 6A, Subsection 3 seems to have been to pacify the apprehension of the people of Assam that conferment of citizenship would not have an immediate impact on the then upcoming elections in the state of Assam due to the inclusion of a large number of immigrants. The apprehension was taken care of by the scheme of Section 6A, Subsection 3, which provides for the removal of the immigrants belonging to the 1966-1771 stream from the electoral rolls for a period of 10 years from the date of their detection. Section 6A subsection 3 embodies the approach of the government of the day in finding a middle ground between two competing interests prevailing at that time. On one hand, adopting a humanitarian approach towards the immigrant population in Assam, and on the other, ensuring that large-scale immigration doesn't result into the loss of culture, economy, and the political rights of the people of Assam. While construing the object of enactment of Section 6A, one should not lose sight of an important fact, that Section 6A was enacted to give a statutory avatar to certain clauses of the Assam Accord. The provision thus could be said to have been multifaceted in design and purpose and representative of the interests of all the parties to the negotiation. I am of the view that the intention of the parties while signing the accord should be kept in mind while construing the object of Section 6A of the Citizenship Act. <clears throat> then I have said on whether the onus of detection of foreigners of the 1966-71 stream lies on the state. From a perusal of Section 6A and the associated rules, it is clear that there is no provision which prescribes or provides for self-declaration slash registration or voluntary detection as a foreigner within a given time 
criteria for availing the benefit of citizenship by registration under Section 6A, Subsection 3. The mechanism of implementation of Section 6A is set into motion with the first step of reference of a suspected foreigner to the foreigner's tribunal. As soon as a reference is made to the tribunal, the onus is on the suspected person to either establish that he or she is an Indian citizen or to establish that he or she is an immigrant eligible to avail the benefit available under Section 6A. Once the tribunal holds that the suspected person is a foreigner of the 1966-71 stream of immigrants, then again the onus is on the said person to get registered in accordance with the Citizenship Rules 2009, failing which his or her claim to citizenship would abate. While the statute is clear that the onus completely shifts on the suspected foreigner once a reference is made to the tribunal, it appears to me as illogically unique that a person wanting to avail the benefit of citizenship by registration under Section 6A, subsection 3, has to await identification as a suspicious immigrant and subsequent reference to the tribunal. There is no plausible reason why it should be impermissible for him or her to set the mechanism of Section 6A into motion by voluntarily choosing to get detected as a foreigner of the class specified in Section 6A or to make an application for conferment of citizenship. Further, what stands out as palpably rational in the scheme of Section 6A of the Citizenship Act is that there is no end date after which the benefit of citizenship under Section 6A, subsection 3 cannot be availed. I have dealt in later parts of this judgment as to how this militates against the very purpose of the enactment of Section 6, capital A, Subsection 3. I have now said something on temporal reasonableness. Neither Section 6A nor the rules made thereunder prescribe any outer limit for the completion of detection of all such persons who belong to the 1966-71 stream and are eligible to avail the benefits of Section 6A, Subsection 3. The clock only starts to tick once the detection is made by the foreigner's tribunal and there is no prescription as to the period of time within which the exercise of this detection is to be completed from the commencement of Section 6A. The absence of any prescribed time limit for detection of foreigners of the 1966-71 stream has twofold adverse consequences. First, it relieves the state from the burden of effectively identifying, detecting, and deleting from the electoral rolls in accordance with law all immigrants of the 1966-71 stream. Secondly, it insensitizes the immigrants belonging to the 1966-71 stream to continue to remain on the electoral rolls for an indefinite period and only get themselves registered under Section 6A once detected by a competent tribunal. Hence, the manner in which the provision is worded counter serves the very purpose of its enactment, which is the speedy and effective identification of foreigners of the 1966-71 stream their deletion from the electoral rolls, registration with the registering authority, and conferring of regular citizenship. As submitted on behalf of the petitioners, the open-ended nature of Section 6A, Subsection 3 also subserves the legislative intent behind the enactment of the IEAA 1950 and the spirit of the Assam Accord. In the absence of any statutory mandate to do so within a time limit, and there being no temporal limit to the applicability of Section 6A, Subsection 3, it follows that any immigrant of the 
71 streams whose name figures in the electoral rolls would not voluntarily want to get detected as a foreigner, as upon detection, such immigrant becomes liable to having his or her name struck off from the electoral rolls. It is also required to register with the registering authority within a specified time period, failing which he or she would become liable to deportation. Even otherwise, no person belonging to the aforesaid category would, out of their own volition, get detected as a foreigner due to the inherent subjectivity that is involved in the process of scrutiny and determination of the various conditions as stipulated under Section 6A, Subsection 3, that is, date of entry into Assam, ordinary resident, etc. However, the same degree of reluctance would not have been present on part of the immigrants of the said category if the procedure of conferment of citizenship under Section 6A, Subsection 3 was instead a one time exercise which was to be mandatorily undertaken in a time-bound manner by anyone who wished to avail the benefit of citizenship under the said provision, and any failure to abide by such time-bound procedure would have resulted into the abatement of their claim to citizenship. Seen thus, the working mechanism of Section 6A, Subsection 3 goes against its avowed objective. Upon perusal of the statutory scheme under the Citizenship Act, the Foreigners Act 1946 and other related provisions, it could be seen that the mechanism prescribed for giving effect to Section 6A is imbued with the idea of temporal limitations and in the absence of temporal limits on the period during which 6A is made applicable, the provision counterserves the object it was enacted with. It could be argued that the principle of temporal unreasonableness cannot be made applicable to a situation where the classification still remains relevant to the object sought to be achieved by the provision. However, as discussed in the foregoing paragraphs, the underlying object behind the creation of two distinct categories of immigrants under Section 6A of the Citizenship Act could have been achieved only if the exercise of detection of the immigrants of the 1966-71 stream and their deletion from the electoral rolls was conducted in an en masse and time-bound manner. However, the same having not been achieved as intended, I find no justification to hold that the classification made between the immigrants of the pre-1966 and 1966-71 stream still remains relevant to the object of Section 6A. To allow Section 6A to continue indefinitely for all times to come would tend to amount to taking a reductive and one-sided view of the historical context in which Section 6A came to be enacted, more particularly that Section 6A sought to achieve a delicate balance between two competing interests. In the last, on manifest arbitrariness vis a vis temporal unreasonableness, I have said, from a perusal of the scheme of Section 6A, subsection 3, it is evident that the procedure prescribed therein leaves the possibility of differential application on similarly situated persons wide open. From any view of the matter, the way in which the provision is worded doesn't effectively serve either the purpose of granting citizenship to the immigrants belonging to the 1966-71 category, nor does it effectively serve the object of the expeditious deletion of the same category of immigrants from the electoral roads. On the contrary, as discussed in the foregoing paragraphs, Section 6A, in the absence of any temporal limit to its application with the afflux of time, is rather counter-serving the object with which it was enacted. The mechanism doesn't permit an immigrant of the 1966-71 stream to voluntarily seek citizenship. 
and such an immigrant has to wait indefinitely for a reference to be made to the foreigner's tribunal. Similarly, in the absence of any specified date for availing the benefit of citizenship under section 6A subsection 3, the object of expeditious deletion of immigrants from the electoral roll is not met. While the test of manifest arbitrariness entails a two-pronged test, which requires that first, there is a reasonable classification based on an intelligible differentia, and secondly, that such classification has a rational nexus with the object sought to be achieved by such classification. The test of temporal unreasonableness, on the other hand, would involve a further examination into whether the aforesaid two prong have been have continued to remain relevant with the passage of time. Thus, the test of temporal unreasonableness would require examining the provision in two different time frames. First, when the provision was enacted, and secondly, when such provision comes to be challenged on the ground of temporal unreasonableness. Even if a provision passes the two prong test, in the first time frame, it may still fail the test in the subsequent time frame if the afflux of time renders either the classification or the object sought to be achieved by such classification or both as arbitrary and thus violative of Article 14 of the Constitution. This could be said to be the third prong in the test of manifest arbitrariness under Article 14 as envisaged by the doctrine of temporal unreasonableness. The conclusion. Section 6A has acquired unconstitutionality with the afflux of time. The afflux of time has brought to light the element of manifest arbitrariness in the scheme of Section 6A, subsection 3, which fails to provide a temporal limit to its applicability. The prescribed mechanism shifts the burden of detection of a foreigner solely on the state, thus counter-serving the very purpose for which the provision was enacted, that is, the expedient detection of immigrants belonging to the 1966-71 stream, their deletion from the electoral rolls, and conferment of de jure citizenship only upon the expiry of 10 years. My learned brother, Justice Surya Kant has acknowledged the fact that despite the enactment of Section 6A, the influx of illegal immigrants into the state of Assam did not abate after 1985. My brother has relied upon the report published by the then governor of Assam in 1998 to underscore that there are hordes of immigrants who have illegally entered Assam and are residing there. However, the ultimate view taken by my lord is that such illegal immigration cannot be attributed to Section 6A, which is limited in its ambit and does not by itself create unabated immigration. As discussed earlier, Section 6A, owing to its inherent problems of absence of temporal limit and the sole onus of detection upon the state, has indeed resulted in the influx and continued presence of illegal immigrants in the state of Assam to this date. On another issue on which I would like to dis respectfully disagree with my learned brother, Justice Surya Khan, pertains to the fundamental premise that Section 6A aligns with the fundamental purpose of Articles 6 and 7 respectively of the Constitution. That is, Section 6A also confers citizenship rights on those affected by the partition of India. However, a careful perusal of Section 6A, Vesavis Articles 6 and 7 respectively, would reveal that despite a few similarities between the two, the crucial difference lies in the fact that in Article 6, the onus of registration for a person seeking citizenship lies on that person and not on the state. Additionally, all those persons who migrated to India from Pakistan after 19th of July 1948 had to make an application before the commencement of the Constitution. The permit system which was introduced 
as per Article 7, was also brought to an end in 1952, as discussed in the foregoing paragraphs. However, as discussed, both these conditions, that is, the onus of registration, as well as the specification of a cutoff date, till which such applications could have been made are absent from the very scheme of Section 6A. Seen in the context of temporal unreasonableness, this glaring absence renders the scheme of Section 6 capital A arbitrary and as, and as a result unconstitutional. For all the foregoing reasons, I have reached to the conclusion that Section 6A of the Citizenship Act deserves to be declared invalid with prospective effect, and the same is accordingly declared so. I summarize my final conclusions as follows. A. Immigrants who migrated before 1 1 1966 and were conferred deemed citizenship on the date of commencement of Section 6A subsection 2, subject to fulfillment of all the conditions mentioned therein, shall remain unaffected. B. Immigrants who migrated between 1 1 1966 and 24 3 1971, both inclusive, and have been granted citizenship after following the due procedure prescribed under Section 6A, Subsection 3, shall remain unaffected. C. Immigrants who migrated between 1 1 1966 and 24 3 1971, both inclusive, and who have been detected as foreigners and have registered themselves with the registering authority as per the prescribed rules, shall be deemed to be citizens of India for all purposes from the date of expiry of a period of 10 years from the date on which they were detected as foreigners. B. Immigrants who migrated between 1-1-1966 and 24 3, 1971 both inclusive, and who have been detected as foreigners but have not registered themselves with the registering authority within the prescribed time limit as per the Citizenship Rules 2009 will no longer be eligible for the benefit of citizenship. E. Immigrants who migrated between 1 1 1966 and 24 3 1971, both inclusive, and whose applications are pending for adjudication before the Foreigners' Tribunal, or who have preferred any appeal against any order of such tribunal, which is pending before any court, will continue to be governed by Section 6A, Subsection 3, as it stood immediately prior to the pronouncement of this judgment till their appeals are disposed of. And last, F, from the date of pronouncement of this judgment, all immigrants in the state of Assam shall be dealt with in accordance with the applicable laws, and no benefit under Section 6A shall be available to any such immigrant. To be precise, if someone is apprehended as an illegal immigrant after the pronouncement of this judgment, Section 6, capital A of the Citizenship Act will have no application. This is my humble opinion. Thank Grateful you. Thank Grateful you very much to all the learned counsel who rendered valuable assistance. My two law clerks, their assistance has been very valuable. And in the last, above all, I am beholden to my Lord, the Chief Justice, for this opportunity. Grateful to all of you. Grateful to the board. Thank you. And let's join my learned brother, Jason Pardiwala, and thank all of you for this amazing assistance which you got in the matter. Thank you very much. Grateful. Grateful.